and it returned that evening to sit just outside the circle of the outdoor cooking fire. He hopped a little closer when Amakios tempted him with a bit of stew meat. So Anak's back, but he's still like not really sure what's happening and if he's in trouble. And he's probably still a little bit upset. He never did trust Mama again, though. Never did perch near and watch her at work, tipping his head side to side as though he were learning her actions. He still warned her of all approaching animals or strangers, but he was wary of her ever after she lost her temper and kept his distance, which made her sad. And Egg did, however, perform a great service in the winter cabin. So And Egg never really recovers that trust in Mama after she lost her temper and yelled at him and threw something at him. And this makes Mama sad. She does regret her actions and is sad that she lost that trust. While Amakios dragged kettle after kettle of mud to the side of the cabin and along with Angeline, chinked the cracks that had opened during hot weather, and egg hunted. His vigilance and hatred for mice helped the whole family in their efforts to ready the cabin for winter. He chased mice, tried to pounce on them, swept them away with his wings, and even caught a few and pecked them sharply as though to warn them, and they never did come back. They sought other cabins and wigwams where there was not a frightful crow to bother them. So even though Andex still doesn't really trust Mama, he's still working to make things um, better and help the family. Now it was time to harvest the wild rice that grew across from the island in the great sloughs of Kakagon, where Mama's brother and one of her sisters lived. It was a part of the year everyone looked forward to because there would be cousins to play with, games in the rice camps, the pleasures of talk, feasting, more talk, more visiting, and feasting. So they get to see their family. Early in the morning then, they all set out in the canoe they had worked on a year ago. It was beautifully made, light and strong, carefully waterproofed with pitch by Grandma, who kept it in good repair and in its own house by the side of the lake. They all got in, Mama and back to paddle and steer, Grandma up front taking turns with Angeline, who held Nemo in his cradle board. They all fit into the canoe with plenty of room to spare. That space, they hoped, they would fill with the wild rice, the manaman, the good seed that would sustain them throughout the winter. So they're going to harvest this rice so that they can save it and have food throughout the winter. Amakias envied her big sister. She wanted to hold and play with her smiling baby brother. Nilo had a second tooth and seemed even prouder of it than the first. Amakias had saved a bit of hard bannock bread for him to chew on, and she put it in his mouth. Nilo never even bit her. Amakias put her finger to his cheek and stroked it softly. Why, oh, why did she have to take care of Big Pinch? She sighed and turned to him. She was in charge of Pinch, or he was in charge of her. She wasn't sure which, because it was one of his mischief days when nothing she could do would satisfy him. And Egg, perched on Amakias' shoulder, was settled in for the long ride and sympathetic to Amakias. He knew that Pinch had something to do with the bad day Mama had lost her temper. So even though the relationship is somewhat improved, Amakias does still have envy for Angeline, um, primarily because Angeline's the one getting to take care of Niwo and Amakias is stuck taking care of Pinch. Before they started out, Grandma gave her tobacco to the water and asked for a safe, smooth crossing. The sun was mild and the waves low, the wind fresh but still warm, and things would have gone perfectly if Pinch hadn't teased Andeg, but he did. Every time he thought no one was looking, he tried to pull a feather out of Andeg's tail. Gago Pinch, said Amakias. Gago Pinch, said Angeline. Gago Pinch, said Mama when he tried again. Gago Pinch, said Grandma wearily. Gago Pinch, said Amakias again. So it sounds like they're getting really frustrated with the antics of Big Pinch and trying to pull tails out of Andeg's fe uh, tail, pull feathers out of his tail. They must have said it more times as they traveled the lake than there were waves or fish alongside of them. They said it so many times they didn't hear themselves anymore. Stop it, Pinch. Gago Pinch, stop it, stop. Same as when they said it on shore. Pinch didn't hear it. He just kept trying to pull a feather. Finally, Pinch got a hold of the black tip of Andeg's pride and joy, his tail. Gago Pinch! Everyone gasped. This time it was Andeg who spoke. 
terrified at the crow's harsh croak, Pinch nearly threw himself out of the canoe, nearly tipped them all over in his panic to get to Mama, who yelled, of course, Gago Pinch, causing Andag to flap his wings and say again, Gago Pinch, which made Pinch cry, an embarrassment he never quite got over. So even Andag himself spoke words. He was so frustrated with Big Pinch, and he heard over and over Gago Pinch. He finally got frustrated and kind of spoke his first words, telling Pinch to stop. And then Pinch freaked him out, and he almost fell out of the canoe, and then he started to cry, and it embarrassed him. From then on, he regarded Andeg with stubborn awe, treated the bird with reserved respect, and in fact behaved just a little better for just a little while, as Nokomis told him that his rascal ways annoyed even the animals. Wait until you hear what Mukwa, the bear, says, or Grandfather Owl, Think of that, Nokomis scolded. Pinch didn't want to. When they reached the river's entrance and paddled toward the rice camp, Grandma noted with disappointment the thinness of the rice stalks. Too much standing water in the spring had caused them to grow too quickly. Some of the rice had drooped right over into the water. She frowned. The season would be a poor one unless the water in the other rice beds had been lower. So now, Grandma's a little upset. They really rely on this rice to have food throughout the winter. They reach the shores of the camp, and there, amid the general happiness at seeing one another, the grown-ups learned the rice was indeed sparse that year. This was not good news, but the children could not have cared less. Nothing ruined their fun. Immediately, Amakias raced off, her crow flapping alongside her to find her cousins and introduce them to her friend and egg. There under the tree, she saw Wishcom's daughters, Little Bee and Twilight, and her cousins, including Tata, a thin and quiet boy just a little younger than Amakias. He was the son of her mother's brother, Ekwanzi. As soon as Amakias saw Tata, an itchy, joking mood always came upon her, and she looked around to see what tricks she could play on her quiet cousin. His older brothers were rough and ran wild, and he had a sister known as a strong, swift runner. Her name was Two Strike Girl, and she was better than most boys at hunting and fighting. She had to be forced to do the things girls normally did, and her mother and grandma had finally given up on her. I'm dancing the rice this year, Two Strike Girl, total Makias, right off. That was most often the boy's job, but she had persuaded the rice chief she could do it. Early the next morning, the rice boss blessed the harvest, and Mama set out with Auntie Muskrat, who pulled in back while Mama used her rice sticks to bend the stalks toward her and knock the rice grains off into the bottom of the boat. That year, although the harvest was not the best, there was rice for everyone, and as always, work that could not be avoided. Amakias grumbled when Grandma asked her to go pick reeds. Take two strike girl with you, she ordered. Pick enough for two mats. So Amakias and her cousin went to the side of the slough where the fattest reeds grew and used their knives to slice them off below the waterline, bunch after bunch, until they had great bundles that they carried back to camp on their shoulders. Here, said Two Strike Girl, dumping hers off. She gathered herself to spring away, but Grandma caught her. Stay, ordered Grandma. Help your cousin weave. Two Strike Girl looked alarmed and then horrified at the idea of doing girls' work. Still, because she was ordered to do it by Grandma, she sat down beside Amakias and began to weave the reeds into strong, simple mats that they would use to smoke the rice. Even now, the great fire Mama had prepared was burning down to its embers, and as the girl's fingers moved unwillingly, Pinch was just as unwillingly gathering up rotten old pieces of maple wood to use in smoking the rice. When he had gathered several sagging piles of the crumbly maple wood, and when the mats were finished, Amakias is regular and straight in its weave, and two strike girls crooked and gaping, Mama took the mats and set them over the smoking maple fire. Then on top of the mats, she poured the rice, which began, after the mat was properly heated, to give off a most delicate nutty aroma. Using a rake made from a stick of red willow pulled up by the roots, the two girls took turns turning the rice over and over, smoking and toasting the grains. As the rice cooked, it gathered the taste of the maple. 
I can't take this anymore, cried Two Strike Girl, throwing down the stick. If I have to work, at least I'm going to have some fun at it. Running over to a bark-lined pit in the ground, she jumped in and began treading rice with a frantic pace that made everyone around her laugh. It was the sight of the impatient two-strike girl dancing the rice that Omakias would remember long after in the deep winter of the year. Her face was flushed and thrilled with effort. She was tireless. All day and the next, two strikes legs moved up and down. Her feet in clean new moccasins crushed the tough holes. She never stopped. And all the time her eyes were shining, her white teeth set in a huge grin. And Deg danced up and down with her on a limb above. Come help me, she called to Amakias. Jumping to help her cousin, Amakias felt as proud and bold. The two held hands and stepped high, day after day, night after night. Although the family did not return with as much rice as they needed, Amakias and Two Strike Girl became such good friends that ever after they called each other sister. <laughs>